So, welcome. Uh, Anka, as I'm sure you know, uh, was a candidate for Parliament from the Pirate Party, is now a candidate for the uh, European Commission's Parliament, uh, again for the Pirate Party, and she has a new book out. Uh, she was surprised I just managed to get it on, in, in the store yesterday, so uh, it is in fact out. Uh, I want to quote from the beginning, wenn ich richtig übersetzen kann, that Anka says that you were, I was born in the DDR, or I was, I was raised in the DDR, I'm a woman, I'm a political uh, thinker and engaged person. Um, three reasons why in my life I've fought against walls. Walls that as individuals and as society uh, hinder progress. Is that Ricky? Yeah. Close enough? Um, so you write about, about walls and about walls coming down. You write about uh, a connection here uh, from the um, Stasi to the NSA. Not saying that they're the same, but saying that there are lessons to take. So why don't you start by telling us a bit of your story and where the book begins and where your life begins. Yeah, the first uh, page of my book, that was from the forewash, but the real part of the book um, starts with what I did and where I was when the wall fell. So that was still the um, most emotional moment in my entire life. At that time, I was 21 years old and an art student in southern East Germany. And like most art students, I guess, I was um, very actively involved in what was going on. So every night, uh, we didn't have copiers or things like that, no Facebook events. So we were, I was sitting every night and typing on my grandfather's typing machine, resolutions, manifests, and complaints to ministries, for example, when um, a Russian monthly paper, uh, which was writing very much about glasnost, was prohibited in East Germany. So I was complaining about the censorship, things like that. And this was the time when the Stasi uh, started to have a file on me. It starts in November 88 with me complaining at the Ministry for Postal Affairs. And then they were opening my letters. They didn't bother to... Um, use hot steam or so, they just arrived open. They tapped into my phone, they searched my um, student home, and eventually they started to hire me as an informal um, spy, to spy on my fellow students. And this is actually the point where I today believe there's a very close connection between Stasi and NSA, the strange, uh, it may sound for you. But they tried to convince me, of course I wouldn't do it voluntarily, by blackmailing me. And to do that, they used really innocent information about me and my personal life. I was very good in French at that time, which was unusual for East Germans, so I won a um, national competition for art students. I won a three-month scholarship for a Paris art school in East Germany, which was really something totally crazy to believe. Um, this was a bit of information they had. They also knew that my father was the only breadwinner in my family and was a state-employed medical doctor. So they tried it the nice way and were asking me whether I would be thankful to the government, which lets me study and work for them. And I said, well, I'm sorry, no. And then they started to say, do you look forward to Champs-Élysées and the Eiffel Tower? And you know, without our sign off, you are not going there. And when this didn't work, they said, you know, you are a responsible, feeling daughter, aren't you? Your father is the only breadwinner in the family, and don't you want to stay like that? Don't you want to show some gratitude because the government is paying for his job and he finances the family? I still said no, so my conscience is clean. But I know that something like innocent information doesn't exist, you know? Mm. And this is what we are being told today, that we have nothing to hide. And those information, I mean, of what use is it? Every information can be used against you, about your passions, about your fears, about relationships you have. And this is something we must remember. Well, and, and key to that, and I've argued this too, is that government portrays itself as the best protector of privacy when it in fact is the worst threat to privacy because it can use our information against us in ways that no other institution can. Yeah, and it is, um, it's even increasing insecurity of the entire internet system by building black door, uh, back doors in it, which can also be used by third parties and not only by the government. But um, US Senator Murphy went in Berlin some weeks ago, he said, 
Um, he doesn't like the comparison to the Stasi because we have the good guys in our secret services. They don't abuse data. But my father, who turns 80 this summer, he told me the shortest part of his life he has seen democracy. He has seen the Nazi time, he has seen East Germany. Now, for the last bit of his life, he sees the democracy. Where would he take the trust from that this is going to stay like that? Even if we believed, what I do not, that they are all good guys and don't do anything bad with the data, how can we be sure that that's still the case in 20 years or 30 years? So the only protection we have against the potential abuse, and the potential is big, is not to have those data silos. It's the only protection. And that's why we must stop this mass surveillance. Well, yes, I'll agree with that. But I also think that we have to recognize that data and sharing are good things for society. What we need is the trust to be able to do so. We need the protection and the principles. And that strikes me as there's two levels yeah. here. One is that we live under principles, and we operate under principles. And second is we have the oversight to make sure those principles are maintained. In the case of the NSA, oversight failed. Executive branch didn't do it. Courts are secret, and those aren't really courts. Legislature was kept secret. Uh, the journalists didn't know. We had the oversight of last resort, which was whistleblowers. Yeah. And now we also have the fear that whistleblowers are being spied on with the journalists as well. So we have to find the architecture of freedom here that enables this kind of communication and this kind of discussion. And you know what? It's not only an American problem. Our secret services in Germany are out of control as well, and they are probably in most of the countries. And coming from a country which you might describe as a, a totalitarian state, I say there are some principles which make a democracy e-democracy. And that is first, of course, you have free elections, but that's not sufficient. What I expect from a democracy is that it has fundamental basic human rights in the Constitution, which are actually adhered to always in all cases, which is no more the case. And the third thing I expect from a democracy is that it does not use totalitarian methods, because when it starts doing so, then it's starting to leave being a democracy. It's no democracy in a clean definition anymore. And this goes to your point about good guys. Even if you do something bad in the name of, as a good guy, you change the architecture yeah. of the net or society so that the bad guy who follows can do bad yeah. things with the same power. It's like torture. I mean, there is no reason to use torture. There is no excuse for doing so, not even for the best cause. Same goes for mass surveillance. When you use mass surveillance, it's no longer e-democracy. Survey people are not free. It's as simple as that. You stand in an amazing position, has, having been, and as an American, this saga amazes me to see, to see what has happened in, in, in Germany. You stand in the position of having been part of a movement that brought down a government and brought down a totalitarian regime. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty the, damned amazing. That's the good thing. Okay, so, so we East Germans, we should remember how we did it, and everybody else should too. So what are the lessons? The lessons are, first, we have to understand that all these things happening do indeed leave democracy, uh, the ground of democracy. And we have not only at that time we fought to get democratic rights, democracy is not there forever, probably. So we have to fight to keep them. Otherwise, we might lose them again. And we have to do it in exactly the same way as we did it in 89. We have to march in the streets, many of us. We have to just get off our sofas, and that's exactly the reason why I wrote this book, to tell people how relevant it is, how, it, how important it is to now defend our democracy, because it may be too late one day, and I know how this looks like, and it is not a very nice memory. There have been many good things in GDR, but definitely not the totalitarian bit, definitely not the surveillance bit, definitely not the lack of freedom of speech. And it's starting already now. I had, um, I had started two petitions with change.org. I collected more than 100,000 signatures against the prison program. But some people wrote me emails, and it has been not just three or five people. And they wrote me that they share all my opinion in the petition, but they do fear to sign it because it is a public signature, and they want to go to the uh, United States one day, so they don't do it. This is censorship. As I remember it in East German times, we did it every day. We have been experts on self-censorship. 
And we know today in East Germany there is a scientist for sociology who was using the very common word gentrification, but when he started research, it was not yet that common. So he was surveyed because that was suspicious. The word you don't, you never know when you become a suspicious but, person. But that's, but that's really important, Anka, because it's not just about protecting privacy and the ability to keep something in your head. It's also about the freedom to speak. Yeah. It's, 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 it's freedom of speech is tied integrally with that. That's why I say you are no longer free, because these processes start immediately and they start already today. And I, I found this pretty normal in East Germany. I was raised in the system. And if those totalitarian methods are used in a totalitarian state, so no surprise. I mean, what do you expect? So the censorship in your head belongs to the system. But to see this, totalitarian methods used in a democracy today and have the same effect of scissors in your head, which is kind of um, telling you what words to use and what words might bring you onto some radar screens where you don't want to be, this is a fucked up system. Um, tweet that. Um, so you took part you took part in bringing down a government, yet now you want to join government. Why? Yeah, because I believe it's still enough democracy to change it from the inside. And so, are you an optimist? Of course. I mean, that's, that's why, you know. The one lesson I learned in East Germany is that there is no big societal change. May it look impossible as it be, which is not potentially possible to achieve. Who of East Germans would have thought the wall would fall? Nobody. Whoever tells you it's a lie. We did not expect this to happen. We still marched in the streets. We just did it. And I will never in my life forget that we achieved that change. So if that was possible, the totally impossible, then everything else is possible. And that's why I believe we can get our democracy back. We can get freedom back. We can get a free internet back. So I'm, I'm a totally optimistic person, otherwise I wouldn't spend nights again fighting for that, you know, just like those days. Well, indeed, we've seen the reaction to the NSA story, and as I said on stage here the other day, I apologize as an American, um, has been very strong in Germany, this strong in, the, in, in America, and this strong in the UK, where the GCHQ is also doing terrible things. Is it, is it possible, do you think, is it necessary that the, that the German society is going to lead the fight here? I believe uh, we have to. It's our historic responsibility because it's our national history which makes us so sensitive. But we, we saw Obama finally was forced by Snowden's revelations to have to address this, but he moved an inch when perhaps he should have gone miles. Should we be depressed about that? What's, what's the time frame of this reform? We have no time to lose. That's why I decided to run for the European Parliament elections, because I thought waiting four more years until the next federal parliament elections in Germany may be too late. So, I think we have to, I'm going to push the clock. One question, one time for one question, one argument. Okay, over here, if we can have a mic over here, please. If you speak quickly, I'll maybe get two. It's not very good question. Add something to the to the discussion. My name is Georg Zoche. I'm coming from a Munich research company, and we had industrial esp espionage problems in the 90s. We called the German secret service, the BND. They they sent people over to us, informing us in the 90s that every telephone communication, every fax, every email, 100% that goes in and out of our office would be tapped by the United States. So that was publicly, no, uh, not publicly, but uh, the BND knew about it since decades. So if they say now, wow, Snowden made it public, that's not quite true. Well, BND knew about it, and you had to ask to yeah. find out. I have one final sentence for that. In East Germany, we said, proletarians of all countries unite. Today, we have a system of secret services of all countries unite, and they do it. And, and so we, we yeah. the citizens, must unite. We, the citizens, have to uni unite. We have to get control over this, because all secret services, regardless of the society they act in, by their DNA, always want to do whatever they can do. They will stretch laws and ignore laws, and we just have to see to it that this is not going to happen, because it's a danger for democracy. Finally, you have... Oh, okay, one more, real quick, real quick. I'm, I'm violating the law, but fine. Hi, Ralph Eric Kunz. Um, 
I basically grew up in the U.S., um, but um, had a girlfriend in East Germany when the wall came down, so I can relate basically to both sides. Now, a lot of this is based on trauma, you know, to a certain extent. As an East German, of course, you have the trauma of a totalitarian state. Now, as an American, the counter argument would probably be we've got 9 11 and you know, we've got this trauma of being attacked and we have to do something against it. So, how do you basically see, you know, if you take in the arguments of the other side, having to be active against quote unquote terrorism? Um, so, how would you want to factor that in as an argument? Well, our former Federal Ministry of Interior said there is something like a superhuman right, it's called security. Uh, I don't share that opinion. Um, I think security for people is, of course, important. But since what is being done in the name of security, which in many cases is an excuse, as we know, because Angela Merkel, for example, does not wear bumps with her, um, so that's, it's an excuse. Um, I was at the World Trade Center on 9-11. I saw the destruction firsthand. I felt it firsthand. I have the impact still. I believe in the need for security. I believe in the need for uh, relevant secrets. But I first believe in the principles of a democracy. And if we lose those principles yeah. in the process, we've lost our own war. Yeah, and the <laughs> what I wanted to say, this excuse is done in the name of the people and their freedom rights are cut off. So if it's in our name, we should decide how much freedom we are prepared to give up for this more security. And maybe people would uh, decide otherwise. And on the other hand, um, I studied um, business administration, so I'm quite a fact-based person, and I ask, where are the facts? In Germany and in the States, it's always said we um, prevented so and so many attacks. There is not for a single attack a hard proof that mass surveillance led to preventing it. There is no proof for it. So it's a lame, a very lame excuse to cut democracy. And we can't make that decision unless we have the information. And we can't have the information if our government keeps us from us. Last thing, you have a room full, finally, at the end here, wonderful DLD, of media, people, media leaders and technology leaders. What's your wish for them to do as a lesson from this? that everybody understands they have a responsibility and they can do something about it. Media is so important to defend our rights, to keep the topic relevant and hot. And I really like to thank also the organizers like Steffi that they give room for this discussion, which is so, so important at this conference, where so many multiplicators and media people are there. Take this information home. Um, ask questions, ask for proofs, and get back to your families and friends and tell them if they want to live in a democracy and have their children and grandchildren to live in a free democracy, then they have to act right now because it may be too late. The, elf, uh, the 11th of February is a global uh, day we fight back. Um, you find a website, dayrefightback.org, where you find uh, information about events happening in all places in the world. Do something on this date. Write about it. Take part in activities. Whatever you can do, it will be right. Okay. Thank you so much. Vielen Dank. Yeah. And I'm uh, delighted to pass the stage to a hero of mine.